This video is going to look at surveys for student media, the challenges of doing them, and some strategies to use. A survey is a way to find out facts, so let's start by looking at how a journalist might find facts for a news story. Take a hypothetical news story. There's a rumor that the soda machines on campus are going to be removed. Your staff has heard that administrators, parents, and school nurses are on the warpath trying to get sugary drinks out of the school, but students do not want them removed. So how do you get to the facts and cover the story well? You probably can't go around and interview every administrator, every parent in the community, and every student in the school. A weak reporter might only talk to a few people, probably those who are easy to access and want to talk, and then sum up their findings. But a good reporter works to at least get the perspectives of all these people and understand the nuances and complexities of their feelings, as well as gathering all the relevant facts. It's hard work to do it right, even for a simple story. The good reporter is trying to make sure that the sources she does talk to represent the breadth and diverse perspectives of the school community. Statisticians do something similar. They use two terms, population, which is the total group you're looking at, and sample, which is the subset of the population whom you survey. There's a parallel to the journalistic approach with the statistical approach. One big difference is that statisticians have mathematical standards for how trustworthy information they find is. It's interesting to notice that bias is a big concept for both approaches. Both recognize how bias can harm your ability to get to the truth. For statisticians, bias is the arch enemy of facts. Good statisticians are always worrying about bias creeping into their data and corrupting it. Many non-statisticians want to know how many people they need to survey to get good data. But statisticians will tell you that the quantity of people surveyed is actually not as important as the quality. I'll talk more about what makes for quality later. OK, so surveys are hard, but how can student journalists use them to get trustworthy information? Start by asking how serious the topic is. How important is it that your facts are accurate? If you're looking at a light, fluffy topic, maybe precision is less important. Here's an example. A few years ago, some staff of the newspaper I advised wanted to do a survey to ask the students at our school who their favorite musicians were. They asked me if I thought it would work to do a survey that they sent out to all 285 students by mail. I said that would lead to a lot of bias, mainly because of what's called response bias. In this case, the people who responded were only people who A, read their email, and B, were willing to respond to the survey. For a topic like this, where no one really cared what the facts were, I felt that it wouldn't be a big journalistic sin. So as you can see, they did it. Notice that they did show the method they used for the survey. I'll talk about that later. In contrast, that same year, some students were doing a special edition magazine exploring sexual assault and harassment at the school. Getting good data would be an important element of this project, so they went about using surveys very carefully. Again, this spread shows the methodology used in the survey, and they did a good job of trying to weed out bias. Then they compared the data gathered at our school to some national data, this revealed that while there was sexual assault and harassment in the community, the incidence was actually lower than the national averages, so the use of the survey was important to the project. So the good news is that student journalists can use surveys effectively. The bad news is that it's really hard to do it well when you care about the facts. There are three hard parts to surveys. Designing a good survey, administering the survey well, and interpreting and presenting the data well. So let's look at each of these. Two key parts of designing a good survey are making it easy for people to understand and accurately getting at the data you seek. Those are tied to developing good questions. You might think that just developing questions is an easy part to using surveys. That would be wrong. Let's look at some problems you need to avoid. Leading questions are those that push readers towards one response. Here's an example. Do you agree with seniors who say that we need prom? A loaded question is one that is emotional or highly charged, like, do you agree that the senior projects are a stupid idea? Double-barreled questions ask about two different things in one question. Do you like to read and drink tea? That might seem simple, but what if someone likes to read but hates tea? How do they answer? And absolute questions, as the name suggests, leave no room for variation. If a question asks, do you always take the bus to school? One person might think, well, a couple times a year I walk to school, so I'm answering no. But usually you're not looking for a true absolute answer like that. Wording questions carefully is important to getting quality data. 
It's also important to get your respondents to complete the survey. Partially completed surveys create messy data. So keep the survey as short as you can. Ask yourselves what questions you really need to include and toss the rest. Be tough editors on this. Like proofreading, having a lot of sets of eyes looking over your draft questions should help improve the quality of the questions. But the people doing this need to understand bias and the potential problems with weak questions. So that's a quick overview of designing a good survey. Let's look at the process of administering your survey. As I said earlier, beginners have this myth about the quantity of respondents when they should be more focused on the quality of the data. And again, by quality, we mean that the sample data accurately represents the population you're looking at. So how do you get quality data that accurately represents the population you're concerned about? Another myth beginners stumble on is about randomness. People think that getting a so-called random sample is important. It might be counterintuitive, but it's not important. Again, what is important is that the sample data accurately represents the population you're looking at. If you survey 100 kids at a school of 2,000 students, but those 100 students accurately represent the population of the school in every way that's relevant to your survey, you have a great sample. That's quality data. I think the reason people think that random is good is that they feel like random equals unbiased, and that's a mistake. For example, if you stand at the front door of the school as students come into school in the morning and randomly ask people to fill out a brief survey, you're inviting a lot of bias to mess with your data. For instance, only people who take the time to do the survey will be in the data, and that's a response bias problem. How confident can you be that those people, students who are generous with their time and trying to be helpful, or maybe just friends of the surveyors, accurately represent the entire student body? And what about the time factor? You're only getting people who come to school early. What about the people who are always late or have a job in the mornings? Hopefully you're starting to see that getting quality information from surveys is hard. Probably the two biggest considerations for getting a good sample is trying to get one that accurately represents the population in terms of age and gender. If your school has a pretty similar number of students in each grade, you should try to get your sample to have an even number of students from each grade. The same goes for gender. On the other hand, if you just want to look at seniors, you obviously only need seniors in your sample. There may be other factors that are relevant to your survey, so you need to find ways to work them in. Here are three more considerations. Timing should be as close to all at once as possible. If you survey students from each grade on different weeks over a month, bias can creep in because things that affect students' opinions can change over time. You want to aim for every person who is given a survey to complete it. It doesn't need to be 100%, but you should get close. And doing surveys on paper, where there aren't the distractions of phones or computers, is a better approach. OK, so that's how to administer a survey well. Let's look at how you interpret and present the data you get from a survey. Ask yourself this. Do you remember anything from the survey I showed about sexual assault and harassment? I'll give you a moment to think about it. Odds are that you remember at least one number. Even if the 6% was not the biggest number on the page, it would probably stand out in our memories. That's because numbers and statistics stick out in our minds. They often just hit us harder and stick longer than words. So you have to use them carefully and keep in mind that it's likely people will be struck by them and remember them. Something to include when presenting your data is the method you use to conduct the survey. When was it done? How was it done? Who was part of it? How many were involved? And what were your margin of error and confidence level? More on those two terms later. So when you're presenting the data, just like when you're writing a big story, you need to sort of step back and get the big picture of what you found. When I was a reporter and when I went to write a story, I would go back through all my notes and ask myself what it all added up to. What were the important things to cover in the story? When you do a survey, you should do something similar. Then you should set out to present that information in a clear, balanced, minimally biased way. Simply throwing numbers out does not accomplish this. I took a statistics class in college, and on the first day of class, the professor said, there are three kinds of lies, black lies, white lies, and statistics. Her point was that statistics can be manipulated or just accidentally presented in a way that makes them say many different things. So just like when writing a story, you have to work to present the truth as accurately as possible. Here's an example of not doing that. At first glance, this sideways bar graph seems to show a big difference between girls' and boys' GPAs. 
Well, if we label the data better, we see that the difference isn't really so big. Adding the numbers on the graph helps, but showing a better visual would also help. Graphs, like numbers, tend to leave a big impression with us. So getting your graphs to be easy to understand accurately is important. OK, so as I've been saying, the quality of your data is more important than the quantity of it, right? But at some point, we need to look at quantities. How many people should we survey? Well, it's as simple as this. OK, that's what I got out of sitting in an AP stats class for a week. The good news is that you don't need to understand all that to create a good survey. Few, right? All I'm going to get into from that is two terms, confidence level and margin of error. You've probably heard the term margin of error. You might even understand it. Essentially, margin of error is the precision of a data set, the plus minus range. And confidence level or confidence interval is the trustworthiness of the data. If you have a 95% confidence level, that says if you did the survey 20 times, it would be accurate 19 out of 20 times. But enough of that. Looking at this slide, you might be surprised to see that with a 10% margin of error, you only need about 94 respondents in your sample for a population of 2,000. But that assumes you're doing a lot of work to counter bias and get quality data. But what if you want a smaller margin of error or to sample a larger population? It's hard to believe, but for the population of the United States, if you're OK with a 10% margin of error and a 95% confidence level, you only need a sample size of 96. It's wild. It's counterintuitive. But when you see major polls on something like realclearpolitics.com, you'll often see sample sizes of closer to 2,000. Why do they do that? There are a few reasons. Most notably, they want to lower the margin of error and confidence level. The other thing you can do with a bigger sample is subdivide the sample. For example, you might want to compare Republicans and Democrats, or men and women, or people in various age groups if you have a larger sample. We're not going to get into that stuff, though. So how do you find your margin of error and confidence level? My first recommendation is to ask a good statistics teacher. But the other approach, of course, is to search around the web. If you do that, don't settle for the first thing you find, though. Look a little deeper so you really understand what you're talking about. And now to sum up the quantity question, how many subjects do you need? About 100 is good, as long as you're OK with a confidence level of 95, which is pretty common, and a margin of error of 10%, which is a little high, but still acceptable. But remember, you need to work to get quality data. So finally, if you want to deal with facts, with strong data for something important, design your survey carefully, administer it carefully, and interpret and present the data carefully. Good luck.